Good morning, Lighthouse. Good. All right, cool. You guys are awake. As we continue our sermon series on uh, how being rich in our hearts, I'm going to open up with a scripture as we all stand. Revelation. Jesus is speaking to the church of Laodicea. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would you either be cold or hot? So, be, But because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Oh, wow, that's a great way to start the morning, right? For you say I am rich. I have prospered and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiful, pitiful poor, blind, and naked. And I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. We come, we, we go about life, especially in America, with we have so much. We have opportunities, material blessings. We have knowledge and wisdom and, and all these things, but it can blind us sometimes to realize how poor we really are compared to Christ and the riches he has for us. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. And if we want God to revive our lives, our church, our community, we have to come to him knowing we, got, we have nothing to offer him in, in and of our own selves. Jesus says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? Ecclesiastes 5.19, this is a good one. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the, the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. You know, you can have so much and not have any time to enjoy it. You can have so much and God has blessed you so much, but you're so busy with everything else, you, you're not even enjoying what God has given you. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. Lord, we come to you, we have nothing but ourselves, God. All we have is ourselves. Our righteousness is filthy rags, we are poor. We recognize that we are, but God, you have the riches of the kingdom. God, everything we need is in you. You are our portion forever. Your faithfulness endures to a thousand generations. Mer your mercies renew every morning. God, you, everything is yours. The fullness of the earth is, is God's. Everything is his, he owns everything. Lord, we come to you humble and we ask, God, that you would fill our hearts with your joy, the joy that is not from the world so no one can take it away. Let us see your kingdom. Let us see the people you love. Let us, let us see the people you care for. God, we, we lay down our, our pride, our knowledge, our, our, our desire to be right all the time. We want you. We come to you with, with, a, with a sacrifice of praise. Thanking you, God, for all that you are. You are our provider in all things. A man can receive nothing until, unless it was first given to him from heaven. As we sing. from a song 
to gladness and I have you what more could I want so raise my faith a little higher set my spirit on fire Lord we're today in God's house, isn't it? Amen? Oh, it's so good. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we keep going, and I'm not going to take long because we want to get right into this service. 
Uh, we have uh, three things that, first of all, uh, after the service today, we'd love for you guys to stay, especially those with kids. We have a thing, I think they're calling it downstairs, water and water. So we've got, uh, we've got some pools, some just kind of water sports and things like that down there for the kids, as well as watermelon. So we all love that. Come on down after the service for that. That would be great. And uh, also, if any of you guys have any, did you guys come up the stairs, any of you? Or did you come in the back door? Who came up the back stairs? A couple of you. So you had to walk through an area that was unfinished, right? There was like some floors that were undone and stuff. So we have some really cool things going on downstairs right now that we're, we're changing a lot of things down there. And we really want to give a shout out to the guys that came yesterday. We had such a great uh, turnout. I think we had about 14 guys, if I'm not mistaken, that came, maybe even a little bit more than that, to help down there. And we got a ton of stuff done. So after the service, go down there and check it out. A lot of things are happening down there. And it's just neat to see when a church is growing, things are always changing. And a lot of times in our hearts, we don't want things to change. And we're thinking, why do they? Why do we have to do this? Why do we have to do that? But when, a ch when anything is growing, it is always changing. It's always going forward. It's never staying in the same place. And that's one of the reasons why I'm excited to be here as well, that we are always doing something different here. And God is always moving. And the, for the kids downstairs, that ministry is just getting built up and up and up. And we want to, as Cody shared a couple of weeks ago, if we're not, if we're not investing into our kids, then we just become an old church because they're the ones that are coming up and they're the ones that as we, in, as we put the word into them, the word of God into them, it changes everything. Makes a, uh, it, it, it makes the church vibrant. It makes us whole as a church because we're all part of the same body. And uh, thirdly, I just uh, we have a, another work day actually next week for the VBS. Talking about the kids, where we invest a lot into them, and we're doing VBS for you guys that know. If you don't, that's Vacation Bible School, and it's a, it's I think it's three nights and. We are going to be doing a work day, having a work day for that next Saturday, starting at 9 and ending at 3. Lunch will be provided. So even if you're not going to be involved in VBS for those days that it is going to be going on, we would love to have your help. And I know that those that are leading it, um, Lex and Dan, it would love to have your help as well as those others that are leading. So please come if you can help out next Saturday, 9 to 3. It's not only a great time to be able to help out, but just like we learned a lot of the guys that came yesterday, we learned it is just a great time of fellowship. It's a great time to get to know people that maybe you didn't know before. So we really want to encourage you guys to come out. If you, if you feel like you're not making any connections and you would like to, that's a great place to go. Come next Saturday, help out, and, um, and just you'll meet some people. You'll get lunch, and it'll just be a great time. So that's, that's pretty much it for that. Pastor. Yeah, one more announcement you didn't know about, I didn't know about. We have somebody who literally has come to the church, to church for the very first time in their entire life today. Isn't that awesome? And <clears throat> I would like to ask them to stand, but they're not old enough to walk yet. <laughs> Noah and Stephanie have their new little baby, Isaac. Stand up and show us that beautiful bundle today. Huh? There he is. All right. We are so proud of you. I praise God for that. Amen. Amen. Why don't we just, uh, why don't we just stand together? And let's just open this up in prayer. Dear God, I thank you and praise you for your presence here. I thank you, Lord, that as your word says, if, if, if your presence is, isn't here, then we don't want to be here, Lord God. We, we want to be where your glory is. We don't want to be a place that, that where your glory has departed. And we want to give you the reign and the complete freedom to come in and to speak into our hearts, into our lives, and to do things as you would say to do, Lord. Not what we think is a good idea, not what we think is the right way to go, 
we want to hang on to you with all of our, with all that we have, Lord God, with both hands, and we just commit ourselves to you. We commit this service to you, Lord God, that you would be glorified, that you would be lifted up, Lord God, that we would decrease and that you would increase. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
sense that rises is the prayers of the saints. And the Bible tells us that God is enthroned upon our praises. The praises of his people, he inhabits them. He's enthroned upon them. So one more time, let's praise God together. Praise you, Lord. We give you honor and glory, Jesus. You are the only one who's worthy of honor and glory. That is us rise here. Maybe we, uh, we bring the buckets over and we start to get prepared for that. How many of you guys know that worship isn't just singing songs, right? Worship is an attitude of heart. And 
We can worship God in our tithes. We can worship God in our giving. It's been said a few times that, you know, we really want to invest. Lighthouse is a, is a church that invests in the next generation. A lot of you folks have kids. Some of you folks, Noah, <laughs> Steph, have more than others. <laughs> But aren't you glad that Lighthouse takes the time to invest in our kids, to raise them up? And so you guys, you know, you guys are raising them up. But this is a way for us to also sow into the lives of children, children that you may not have met. And here's the thing is, like, when you take a look at the great preachers, you know, Billy Graham and Charles Spurgeon and some of the others, they had mentors who invested in them people who are willing to give of their time and their money. That is a large dog. <laughs> Wasn't that thing in Harry Potter? That was like the, you know? But we've got the kids here. They're going to be ready. Can we, are we going to bring that over? Do you need a hand? Look at this, Dan's got it. He's not going to be able to do that after we all give to this, right? <laughs> but we're giving to the kids. We're going to sow into their lives. We're going to invest in them. This is going to help with VBS. We always have this competition between the girls and the boys. And uh, I think once the boys won, at one point there was that. <laughs> uh, but let's see if we can make it happen again this year, right, guys? It is not going to happen with that type of response. All right, we have a song that we're going to play for you guys as the kids come around. Um, so why don't we kick that off and uh, let's get ready to give to them. If you're new here and you're not sure what's going on, the kids are coming around begging you for money. So if you have change, <laughs> hold up your hand and they're going to come over to you and they're going to find you and they're going to grab some of those coins and they're going to put them in here. If you don't have change, bills work too. They don't weigh as much, but they're worth a little more.
Bring him to the bucket. Last call. Oh. <laughs> Honey, we're going to Coinstar and we're going to get a bag of pennies for the boys next week. Give it up for our kids. If that took you by surprise, no worries. We'll be doing it again next week. <laughs> Let's prepare our hearts, though. We, we were able to just give in to the kingdom for the kids right now. But uh, how many of you know that God tells us to bring our tithes and our first fruits into the storehouse as well? And that's so that the people of God won't be in want at all. And that's so that the people of God can bless others, so that we can go out, so that we can fulfill the Great Commission, so that we can love on others, so that we can bring others into the kingdom. And as the ushers uh, prepare to take our, our tithes and offerings, we'll just... Uh <laughs> Man, I feel that sometimes, you know. <laughs> what kind of dog is that? I got to know. An English Mastiff. Is that an English Mastiff? <laughs> What's his name? Milo. Milo, you want to prepare your heart with us? He says he's ready. <laughs> Lord, we come before you and we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you that you have blessed us, that you have sowed into us, Lord, that you've withheld nothing from us, that you've poured out the fullness of heaven, the treasure of heaven, so that we could be with you, so that we could have that restored relationship, that renewed spirit, so that we could have life and life more abundantly, Lord. And so we ask that you would bless these, our first fruits, our, our tithes and our offerings as we bring them before you, that you would use them in the kingdom, Lord, just as children are arrows in a quiver and they, they're sent forth by the parents and they go where their parents can't. We ask that you bless these tithes and offerings, that they would be used and that they would go forth to areas that we can't, Lord, that they would minister to those that we don't know, that we may not come in contact with. And God, we just ask you that you would bless this and that you would bless this service in your name, Jesus. Amen. get too excited about uh, Milo over here. Uh, we don't normally allow dogs to be in church, <laughs> but I asked Milo to come this morning as a special guest. He's going to help me preach today. He's part of my sermon illustration. Uh, we'll be introducing him in just a moment. So for that, if you want to get your Bibles ready, open your Bible apps to Ephesians chapter 2 today. And I'm going to ask Greg Rosinski to join me on the platform. And also, if the elders that are here this morning could join me on the platform at this time. <clears throat> Some of them are on vacation. Let's see, Don is not here. Uh, Rich, is Rich here? Okay, Rich is not here. All right. <coughs> so this morning I'm excited to introduce to you uh, Greg. This is Greg, if you don't know Greg. Good and morning. he's the good looking one in the group here. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Did I say something? <laughs> he's one of many good looking guys on the stage right now. Uh, we, we have our... Our men in our church are very active, always doing 
ministry and helping people and having breakfast and Bible studies and hiking trips and stuff. But the last two years, are, we have not had a men's ministry leader that's been inactive in that sense. Uh, so we've just been waiting for God to bring the right person along. And a couple months ago, I just kind of felt a prompting of the Spirit in my heart to talk to Greg about this ministry, asked him what his passion was, what, like, if you could do anything, uh, him and his wife lead the missions team, but other than that, if there's anything else you could do in ministry, what would it be? He says, I just love uh, men's ministry, uh, ministering to, to the guys. And so I asked him to pray about this position. He prayed on it for quite a while and came back to me and said, I, I do believe that this is something that God wants me to do. So we're going to install him as our brand new men's ministry leader this morning. <laughs> Greg, if you'll just uh, stand forward and we're going to lay hands on you. Will you just raise your hands this way this morning in agreement prayer with our prayer? Father, we thank you. For Greg, we thank you for the gifts and calling of God that you have placed upon his life. We believe that <clears throat> you call. You're the one that raises up leaders. You're the one that anoints them. We just appoint them. Yeah. And so, Father, we're asking that your anointing would rest upon him for this ministry as we appoint him today as the men's ministry leader at Lighthouse Church of God. We ask, Lord, that you would use him in a mighty way, that you would give him vision that you would give him the team as he puts his team together, Lord, uh, for all the things that you have in store for us. We know this is a raw, blank sheet of paper, and we're asking you to write on Greg's heart so that he can write on paper what you are saying to us. We anoint him in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you. We thank you for him. Bless him and his wife, their children, their family, their ministry. Cover them as they can lead. Take away anything, Lord, that would hinder him from doing what you've called him to do. And we thank you for the fruit that's going to come forth for the glory of God. Amen, amen, and amen. 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 Congratulations. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, guys. You'll be hearing more about men's ministry this fall. Did you find Ephesians chapter 2? You're opening there. Let me welcome those who are watching online. We have a lot of people watching online this morning because we have uh, a lot of people gone and on vacation. A shout out to the uh, uh, CMA group, our motorcycle, the Christian Motorcycle Association from Plainfield. A bunch of our members are there up in Massachusetts for their big annual rally. Hey, you guys and gals, we miss you today and pray God will use you and bless you where you are. And all those others who are watching online, we just welcome you into our service today. Uh, I want to begin <clears throat> this morning with something a little bit, uh, a little bit humorous. Is that okay? Because you know I like humor. And this last week, I had lunch with a, a pastor from Plainville, not Plainfield, but Plainville. I just met for the first time, and that means my time's up already. <laughs> I just started. <laughs> from Plainville, Wisconsin, and he gave me this, and I just had to share it with you this morning. And this is, this is something that I heard like 20 years ago, and, and it's old school, and I remember hearing it a long time ago. I'm gonna need my water. But it's very, it's very humorous. So it's, it's a true account of Pastor Jack Hayford. How many of you know Jack Hayford is? Two of you, okay. He's a famous pastor on the West Coast, uh, the church on the way from Van Nuys, California. Anyway, he writes, my friend is quite an old-fashioned lady. She's delicate and elegant, especially in her language. She and her husband were planning a vacation, so she wrote to a particular campground asking for reservations. She wanted to make sure this campground was fully equipped, but didn't know how to ask the toilet question. She couldn't bring herself to write toilet in her letter. So after much deliberation, she finally came up with an old fashioned term, bathroom commode. When she wrote that down, she still thought that she was being too forward. So she started all over again and she rewrote the entire letter 
just referring to the bathroom commode as the BC, abbreviations BC. And so she wrote, quote, does the campground have a BC? That was her question. That's what she actually wrote. Well, the campground was, wasn't old-fashioned at all, and when the campground owner got the letter, he couldn't figure out what this woman was talking about. This BC business really stumped him. So after worrying about it for a while, he showed the letter to several other campers, and they couldn't imagine what this lady meant either. So the campground owner finally came up with the conclusion the lady must be talking about the local Baptist church, B.C. And so he sat down and wrote the following reply to her. Dear Madam, I regret very much the delay in answering your letter, but now take the pleasure of informing you that a B.C. is located nine miles north of the campground <laughs> and is capable of seating 250 people at a time. I admit it's quite a distance away, especially if you're in the habit of going regularly. <laughs> but no doubt you will be pleased to know that a great number of people take their lunches along and make a day of it. <laughs> they usually arrive early and stay late. The last time my wife and I went was six years ago. <laughs> And it was so crowded, we had to stand the whole time we were there. <laughs> it might interest you to know that right now there's a supper plan to raise money to buy more seats. They're going to hold it in the basement of the BC. I would like to say that it pains me very much not to be able to go more regularly. <laughs> but it surely is no lack of desire on my part. <laughs> As we grow older, it seems to me more of an effort, particularly in the cold weather. <laughs> if you decide to come down to our campground, perhaps I could go with you the first time and sit with you to introduce you to all the other folks. We have a very friendly community. <laughs> DC. Uh, I want to read that because I I don't want you to be confused about what I'm preaching this morning. The sermon series on rich, and on the sign that says how to be rich, one word makes a big difference. I'm not talking to you about what the Bible says about how to get rich. I'm talking to you about what the Bible really cares about, and that is how that we can be rich. How that we can live a rich life. And my last week we started this message, and I tried to lay the foundation for you. And one of my favorite quotes from last week's sermon, which is, uh, uh, which just kind of sums and puts the whole message last week in a nutshell. And I said, quote, you can have a full life, an abundant life, if you have a lot of things or if you have no things at all. Because it's not about the external things, it's about the internal things and the eternal things. And that's what this sermon series is all about. So having said that, if you'll stand with me, I want to read our text today from Ephesians chapter 2, which is one of my all-time favorite passages of Scripture in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to begin reading in verse number 1. By the way, I'm also going to read two other Scriptures, if you want to put your finger there. Psalm 145 and 2 Corinthians chapter 8 will be referring to those. <clears throat> if you found it, say amen. amen. All right. I noticed the dog was like going to sleep when I got up here. I don't know what that means. Verse 1. As for you, turn to your neighbor and say he's talking to you. Okay? He's talking to his audience now. He's talking to us. You were dead... In your transgressions and sins in which you used to live, when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, it's speaking to, about Satan, the spirit, little s, which is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us, say all with me, 
all of us also lived among them at one time. He's telling us all of us have lived a sinful life at some time. If that's you, raise your hand. The rest of you will figure it out. <laughs> all of us live like those sinners at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Underline that. We'll be coming back to that. Whose wrath? God's wrath. But, and that's a big conjunction, but because of His, His being God, great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. That word transgressions means sins. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God also raised us up with Christ and seated us with him. And I want you to notice the past tense is something that he already did. Seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Why? In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And now he says it again. For it is by what? Grace, grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of from yourselves. It's not something that you have done. It is the gift of God. And again, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Psalm 145. Psalm 145. And we'll be reading verse 8. I love this, this verse. You've heard it. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in what? Rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all that he has made. And then finally, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. Be careful that the exercise of your freedom does not become, I'm sorry, that's 1 Corinthians 8. I was just checking to see if you are paying attention. <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9. Let's start with verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work, as it is written. He has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. It's chapter 9 and verse 8. Now let's go to chapter 8 and verse 9. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that through, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, may become what? You may become what? You may be what? Father, I thank you this morning that we are rich in Christ Jesus. And we can bask this morning in the richness of your grace and of your mercy Amen. Turn to your neighbor before you're seated and say, you're rich. You're rich. You're rich. All right. This morning I want to talk to you about being rich in grace and mercy and being rich in love. You know, there's sometimes as a pastor where I have to preach sermons that are difficult because you know it's going to be hard. You have to give a hard truth. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to make people either repent or hate you, one of the two. <laughs> Even though it's not from you, it's from God. And there are other sermons where you get to preach 
where you just get to tell people how much God loves them. So this morning, I get to preach the latter, to tell you how much God loves you. And I love preaching these kind of sermons because they're powerful. There's no greater power than the love of God. Amen? So in our text this morning, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church, and we are the church. And he, he says in Ephesians 2, and keep that book open because we're just going to be going verse by verse in Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to be staying right there this morning. So Paul says that when he says we, when he uses the terms rich in mercy and the riches of his grace, he is talking about God. He is giving to us the character of God. God reveals himself to us. That's what the word of God is, you know? It's a revelation of God to us and his plan for us. So God reveals to us in these texts that he is a God who is full of mercy, who is rich in mercy and rich in grace. So both of those words are used there, and a lot of times people get confused. They think grace and mercy are the same thing. They're actually similar, but they're very different. So I want to explain this to you to make sure you understand this concept this morning. What does grace mean and what does mercy mean? Mercy means that you do not get the punishment that you deserved. Grace means that you do get forgiveness that's, or something that you did not deserve. Let's say it again. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Now let me give you an illustration to kind of uh, uh, make sure that you get that. Suppose, let's just take uh, Elder John Lathrop. Uh, elder John Lathrop, suppose, just suppose, because he's an elder, he would never do this, but just suppose he got like a speeding violation from a police officer, which, has that ever happened to you? You, know, you don't need to answer that question, John, because we all know the truth. <laughs> you know, suppose that happened to Elder John, and he got, a, he got a ticket, and it wasn't a speeding violation, no. It was a ticket for running a red light. And so he wanted to protest this because he was in Rhode Island, and, and <laughs> the tickets are really high in Rhode Island. John was telling me this. So... <laughs> You're trying to figure out, did this really happen, or is he just giving up his story, and you'll never know the truth? But let's just assume, or suppose, that he did this. And so he went to court and stood before the judge and said, I want to protest. I did not run this red light. And the judge showed him on a video his car, because, you know, Rhode Island at red lights, they have cameras now. And they take videos. And they showed him on video where he ran the red light. So he was caught red-handed, and he didn't know what to say. And so he says to the judge, Judge, I'm sorry. I did run the red light. I will pay the ticket. But the judge looks at John and says, What I see here that you are from Plainfield, Connecticut. And do you attend the Lighthouse Church there? And John says, Yes, I'm an elder at the Lighthouse Church. Oh, well, I wish I'd have known that. Listen, I'll tell you what. You did run the red light. You do deserve the punishment of paying this ticket, but I'm going to give you mercy, and you're not going to have to pay this ticket. Wouldn't that be awesome? That's mercy. He deserved the punishment, but he didn't get it. It was wiped away. Now, that's mercy. But the judge didn't stop there. The judge said, you know, I... I am so blessed by your pastor at that church that I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Not only am I going to not make you pay for what you deserve, I am going to give you a free ride, and for the next five years, you have free reign of the road. Any ticket you have will be ripped up. Your whole driving record will be a sponge. And John's like, what have I done to deserve this? And the judge says, you haven't done anything to deserve it. I'm just giving you grace. You see, mercy was he didn't get what he deserved. Grace was he got something he didn't deserve. Get it? The difference between mercy and grace. And in our text, the Apostle Paul is explaining to us 
that God is the God of mercy and of grace. And he explains that in this way. He begins by telling us in the first few verses that all of us were sinners. He says, such were all of you. At one time, you walked in sin. You were a sinner. Paul explained this in Romans earlier where he said, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Sin is rebellion. It's disobedience against God's law. Has anybody, is there anybody in this room or listening online who has never broken one of the laws of God? If you do, raise your hand so we can all give you a big praise. <laughs> I don't see any hands around here because the truth is we were born as sinners and we've all messed up We've all been sinners at one time. And so he begins by reminding us that we all are sinners. And what's scary about that is in Romans 3.23, he says the wages of sin is death. That's the punishment. That's what the judge has handed down. That's the sentence for sinning. It's separation from God. It's eternal punishment. It's rebellion against him. It's being removed from God. The wages of sin is is death. That's why he says in the next verse, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. He's saying because you were sinners, you were walking a life of death. But then he says, verse 4, that God gave us mercy. Can you say amen? He did this. He says he made us alive, verse 5, he made us alive with Christ. So, he says that God gave us mercy to pay the penalty of sin. He sent Jesus for us in order that we can live and not die. We deserve death, but what we got was life. We did not receive the punishment that we deserve. What was the punishment we deserve? Death. But God gave mercy, and it says in verse 9, he saved us. That's where we get that word saved from. Are you saved? Are you saved? Are you saved? It comes from this passage. Have you been saved from death? Have you been saved from your sins? Now, that's what he did. And he goes on to say, not only did God give us mercy by not giving us the punishment we deserve, but he gives us grace by not only not making us die, but he gives us eternal life. Something we didn't even ask for. Something we didn't earn. Something we didn't deserve. Amen? Isn't God good? See, some people who read this, uh, some people who read this letter from Paul, the Old Testament was their Bible, right? And like some skeptics today, they'll look at the God of the Old Testament and I said, oh, that God in the Old Testament, he's a mean God. He's a God who kills. He's a God who destroys nations and armies and people and vengeance and a God of wrath. And, and we see that. And, and did God do things like that in the Old Testament? Absolutely, he did. But the whole picture, when you read the Bible, is that everything that God does, he does in love. And he loved even those that he destroys. He loves because he is love, and we are his creation, and God loved them, and by allowing his word and his will to come, pass, to come to pass, God sometimes has to hurt you to help you, and sometimes we see that, what, what I want us to see is that the same, Paul is saying, the same God of the Old Testament is no different than the God of the New Testament, they are one and the same, and he has always been a God of love, and he has always, because all that Old Testament time, he was preparing for the coming of his son Jesus so that the whole world could be saved through him to deliver us from the death that was upon us. Not judgment, not wrath, but he was a God of grace. He was sending Jesus. He was preparing the way for Jesus, for us. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little excited. Just trying to try calm down here this morning. <laughs> I just love that God is a God of love. And so... He says, he gives us abundant life. And not only that, but he says, he caused us to be raised up with Christ. 
to sit with him in heavenly places. Now, some people say, oh, he's talking about, he's talking about uh, the, the, the resurrection, that one day we're going to be raised up and we're going to go to heaven. That's not what he's talking about. Number one, it's the past tense. He's not talking about a future event. He's talking about what Jesus did for us. And literally, in the Greek here, the structure of this sentence says that God has already, for those who have repented and found Christ, he has already seated us. In, right now, you are seated in the heavenly realms with Christ Jesus. And you say, well, well that doesn't make sense. How can I be sitting in Lighthouse Church on the earth and be sitting in heaven with Jesus Christ at the same time. What is Paul talking about? Well, obviously, he's not talking about physically, literally sitting with Christ. He's not talking about literally sitting with Christ. He's talking about legally sitting with Jesus Christ. He's talking about what has already been, a, what has already been accomplished in the spirit realm. Now, pay close attention to what I'm telling you this morning because this is the whole nutshell of the gospel. And you need to make sure that you get this. I pray right now for the Holy Spirit to just bring revelation to your mind that the light will be turned on and you'll understand everything I'm saying online. You'll get it this morning. Let me explain what that means to you. You remember, and maybe you didn't know this, in the Old Testament when the temple was built, which was given exact perimeters by God himself, right? It was a type of the temple that was in heaven. One of the things that was unique about the temple was the temple that was built... In the Old Testament, all the temples that were built in the Bible, they were built without a seat. Synagogues had seats on the side. They had logs for people to sit on. Not the temple. The temple had no place to sit. You know why? Because the priest's work was never done. Get that. The priest's work was never done. The priest had to stand all day, every day. They couldn't sit in the temple because their work was never done. Day and night, day and night. We were just singing about it, right? Well, really, that's a reference to the Old Testament law where day and night people had to bring sacrifices for forgiveness of their sins. Sin never stopped, so the priest never stopped. Do you get it? Sin never stopped, so the sacrifices never stopped. But what happened is that when Jesus came, the New Testament says in Hebrews that Jesus is our, our high priest. He is the highest order of priest, right? He is the one mediator between God and man. He is the only one who could give the spotless sacrifice for all the sins of the world and that's exactly what he did and when Jesus died on the cross what were his last words his last words were it is finished in your hands I commit my spirit you heard me preach at Easter what that means that Greek word to telestai it is finished it didn't mean it didn't mean that he was over it meant that his work was over Everything that he came to do to accomplish our salvation was paid. It was an accounting term that said, paid in full. Jesus cried out his last breath and said, it's finished, paid in full. The sins of mankind, past, present, and future, are all paid for through the blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It is finished. And listen to what, listen, no, wait, wait, don't clap yet. Listen. Mark chapter 16, verse 19. Look on the, on the board. It says, after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken. This is, this is when he ascended after his resurrection up into heaven. He says, he was taken up to heaven and he sat down whoo, at the right hand of God the Father. This is described further in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 11. Look at this. This is what I've been trying to say. Hebrews 10 and 11. Look on the screen. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest, which is Jesus, <laughs> hallelujah, amen, when this priest offered the one-time sacrifice for all, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. 
Jesus is sitting down. The priest has found a throne to sit upon because his work is done. No more sacrifice. No more striving. No more works. No more trying to do something to please God that's not going to work anyway. Jesus paid the price. When he died, listen, when he said it is finished, an earthquake shook the ground and the veil in the temple that separated the holy place from the holy of holies where the mercy seat was, where sin was atoned for. The Bible says it was split from top to bottom right into, and we have access to go right in and find mercy and obtain mercy for our time of need. Jesus' body was torn for us so that we could go in and receive mercy and grace, not because we deserve it or earned it, but because he loved us. The work is finished. He sat down. He sat down. The work was done. And Paul reminds us in this text that this is a gift from God. It is, he says, verse 8, not of works. We can't take credit for any of it. It's just God's immeasurable love, grace, and mercy for us. That's how much he loves us. 1 John 3 and 1, I love that verse. It says, behold, what manner of love the Father has lavished upon us that we could be called the sons of daughters of God. Now let me bring this home here. A lot of people, even Christians today, are still living under the law. Jesus came to give you freedom. He came to forgive you of your sins. But a lot of people are still living under the law by thinking that religion is going to get them to heaven. You think that your works and the things you do, you're trying so hard to, to, to play the religious game. I come to church the right amount of times. I pay the right amount of money. I help the widows. I do, I do all this stuff because I want to please God because I want my sins to be forgiven. And that's religion. That's works. That's the law. You're striving, trying so hard to get God to love you because you know that you're not perfect and you're spending your whole life striving, striving, striving. You're living under law even though we're in a day of grace. And Jesus said, I come to set you free from that. That's right. Come on now. Yeah. In fact, bring Milo on up here. Bring him up. So this is Milo. Milo is a mastiff, the largest dog breed in the world. And what you don't know about Milo, this is, this is, <laughs> this is the Vieira, say hi to them. Hi. And <laughs> Joanne and Dave, and they breed mastiffs. And uh, this mastiff here is a champion, champion of champions. And they have, they have bred dogs that have won the Westminster Dog Show. How you doing, Milo? All right. And, so he's what, nine years old? Yeah. So he's like in retirement now. <laughs> he's like in retirement. But, uh, and he just loves people, so we, we picked him to be in church today. And Jenny's going to shoot me, but, you know, it happens. So, uh, <laughs> so I wanted to use Milo because I thought, I, I, I saw, I met Milo at Hank's Dairy Barn about three weeks ago. And I thought, that is like the biggest dog I've ever seen. And I, I thought of an illustration uh, for my sermon this week. So this leash here represents the law. Okay? So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to go over to that side of the stage, if you would, over there. Who, me? Yeah, whoever has the dog That's me. over there. And we need the food on this side. We need the food. Yeah. We need the food on this side. So you go over there with the food. Does he see the food? Does he know what the food is? He's looking at you. We weren't sure if this is look work, but we were certainly okay. So he's now now he knows where the food is. He's watching the food. All right, go on the other side of the stage. Can I can I take Milo with my leash? Okay, I want you to call him. Call him. Call him. Great day. <laughs> All right. Okay, this dog. I am not leading this dog. This dog is leading me. He weighs more than I do, probably. You know. He is big. He is huge, right? 
But now, uh, that's what the law is like, right? The law is you're striving for the prize. You're trying to get there, and you're, you're working for it. But let's suppose now, if you go, I'm going to take this leash off, and now will you just ask her to follow you across the stage and see if she will. Obedience. That's a lot different than being pulled across the stage, isn't it? Right? <laughs> Milo went willingly, was not striving, was not working, just wanted to be by his master. Just wanted to reap the benefits that his master had. I didn't have to coax him. He just went on his own. He did it not because he had to. He did it because he wanted to, right? Give him a hand, Milo. Thank you for coming. All right. Great job, Milo. Thank you to the Vieiras. I don't know. <laughs> He's friendly. Don't worry about it. <laughs> he loves children. <laughs> he eats them for breakfast. No, just. <laughs> Yeah, he loves the kids. So Milo will be after church outside if you want to have the kids pet him. So uh, thank you very much for that. So that's the illustration. Yeah. You get the illustration? So some of you are like striving. You're striving to please God. You're striving to please the master. You're being pulled. The wall has you pulled everywhere. But Jesus says, no, it's freedom. We walk in love in Jesus Christ. The law was inadequate. It could not save people of their sins. It could not fix the sin problem. It just covered up. They put the blood on the mercy seat to cover it up. It just covered up what you had done. But they had to keep going back to the temple, keep going back to the temple, keep going back to the temple. And Paul says, listen, now that Jesus has come, you no longer need to strive. You no longer need to work. You no longer need to do all the stuff God loves you, period. Amen. He loves you, period. Jesus has come with a new command, and it's one command, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. He's come with a new covenant, and it's not a covenant of law. It's a covenant of grace whereby we are saved. And so we just walk in the freedom and the confidence that we have. My sins are forgiven. God is my Father. Hallelujah. We are, you say, well, you know, what, how has that happened? And the Bible calls us sons and daughters, children of God. So this is, this is where it gets home now. If God is our father, it calls us his sons and daughters. And if God is a God of grace and a God of mercy, who does not treat us as our sins deserve, but lavishes his grace upon us, then if we are his sons and daughters, we should also be lavishing grace and mercy on others. Right? Christians should be the easiest people in the world to forgive somebody. It should never be heard that a Christian will hold a grudge. How can a Christian hold a grudge when they are a son or daughter of God Almighty? Grudge is not grace. It's the opposite of grace. Love holds no record of wrongs. Love easily forgives. Are you with me? Can I keep going? We are the sons and daughters of God. The principle is explained to us great in Matthew chapter 18. Let's just turn there, Matthew chapter 18. I don't think we have this on the screen. Do you have it on the screen? Oh, he's got it on the screen. Great. Okay, in Matthew chapter 18, uh, we have the parable of the unmerciful servant. And this is a parable that Jesus gives in response to the question, how often should I forgive somebody that does me wrong? Seven times, Peter said? Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. In other words, infinite number. You should always forgive them. You should always forgive them from your heart. And then to illustrate what he was saying, to make sure they got it, he gave the 
parable of the unmerciful ser uh, servant. Verse 21. Or let's start with Jesus, 20, verse 22. 23. No, 24. No, 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Now, that number in the Greek there would be like saying it's, a, it's an extreme figure. It's like something that nobody would ever have. It's like saying somebody owes you $10 billion, okay? It just means like an extreme amount. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all they had be sold to repay the debt. Now, this is an Old Testament law. The Jews understood this when they understood it, that if you owed somebody something and you didn't pay it back, they had a legal right to enslave your family, have them work for you. Slave doesn't mean like slave like we think, but to put them to work for you for free in your vineyard, in your home, in your business, whatever, until they were paying off the debt. So that, that was their legal right. They did not pay it. He owed a debt he couldn't pay. The judgment was imprisonment, slavery. The servant, verse 26, fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. So the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. What do we call that? Mercy, right? Mercy, there it is. He owed a debt, and he did not have to pay the punishment that he owed him. Verse 25. When the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And a hundred denarii would be like, you know, like a day's wages compared to an infinite amount. He uses two extreme terms in this parable. And he grabbed him and began to choke him. Let me illustrate this for you. Come on up here, Steve. No, just kidding. You get this graphic picture here, right? The guy just owes him like $300, and he grabs him by the neck. You owe me 100 demario. Grabbed him by the neck, began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, I will pay you back. But what happened? He refused. He refused to give him mercy. Instead, he went and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and told the headmaster everything that had happened. And when the master called the servant in, he said, you wicked servant. He said, I canceled all the debt of yours because you asked me, shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy in you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. And look at this, verse 35, he brings it home. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brothers from your heart. Are you getting it? So the, simple, the message is very simple this morning from Jesus. God has forgiven you of everything in your life. So you should easily be able to forgive those who have done you wrong with so little. How in the world can you hold a grudge? How in the world can you hold something against somebody that hurts you? And the only way that you can do that is if you have forgotten what God has done for you. I just got a feeling that when I said it. I feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit here this morning. Because some of you are holding things, you're harboring things in your heart. I don't even, this isn't even my notes. I'm just feeling this this morning. Harboring things in your heart. And you got to understand the seriousness of this. God sees that you are not forgiving somebody else. And he has given you his only son to die on a cross for you. And you're upset because somebody owes you $100. Because somebody called you a name. Because 
somebody did something that hurt your feelings. And this is what says makes God angry. It's not the sinner out there that's sinning. Sinners are going to sin. It's the Christian that's sinning. It's the Christian that knows better. It's the Christian that received God's grace, but you're not giving grace to others. You've received mercy, but you're not having mercy for others. It's a serious thing. The Bible calls us the sons and daughters of God. Luke 7 and 47 says, Wherefore I say unto you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth much. That's when Jesus was, was, was <clears throat> preparing in Jerusalem, a, a woman came who was a woman of ill repute, a sinful woman. The, the doesn't say it, but the, the implication in the Greek is that she was a, like a prostitute or a loose woman. And she came to where Jesus was, and she began to, to wash his feet with her tears and wipe her feet with her hair, and the Pharisees, the religious people, were so disgusted that Jesus would allow, one of them said, if Jesus knew what kind of woman she was, she, he wouldn't let her touch his feet. And Jesus knew what the man said, knew what he was thinking, knew that that guy was living under the law and not grace. And he said, this woman is a sinful woman. And she has found God's grace. And because God has forgiven her of all her sins, she is so easily to forgive others. Because whom much is forgiven, much is required. Jesus said, if God has forgiven you so much, it should be easy for you to forgive them. We ought to love people out of the love that God has for us. What has God forgiven you from? What has forgiven you of? And that's the kind of grace that we should have for others. You say, well, yeah, but you don't understand, Pastor. You don't know what was done to me. Or you wouldn't say that. You don't know that what happened caused the life of my child, caused my marriage, caused my health, lost all of my retirement, took away what I had worked for for 50 years. I, how can I just forgive that person who is damaged beyond my ability to ever repay or repair? And the answer to that question is twofold. Number one, you can't forgive them in your flesh, but Jesus will forgive them through you. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, and Christ will give you the grace to forgive somebody even when you don't feel like it. And it's okay to not feel like it. God knows that. He understands that. But you've got to forgive them. You have no choice to forgive them because God forgave you of much worse. You say, well, I lost my retirement. Yeah, well, Jesus lost his son. Secondly, you can forgive them because of love, specifically because of God's love for you. Verse 4 in our text says, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy and love, forgive us of our sins. I want to talk about being rich in love. As great as mercy and grace are, love trumps them all. In fact, in our text it says that love and or, or that mercy and grace come out of love. Because of his love for us, God who is rich in mercy and rich in grace. Get it? Love is the foundation. Out of love flow mercy and grace. You can't have mercy. You can't have grace if you don't have love. You got to have love first. Amen. You got to have love. And you say, well, I have love. Uh, what's the difference between God's love and my love? And the difference is that God's love is unconditional. And our love is mostly conditional. Can I get a witness? All of God's blessings are not unconditional. You know that, right? Forgiveness is not unconditional. The Bible says it, that it is conditioned upon repentance. If you confess your sins, then God is faithful and just to forgive you. There's that if-then, see? You've got to repent. 
Forgiveness isn't just given to you without repentance. There's a condition there. There's something that you have to do. Salvation is even conditional. Romans 10 says this, right? If you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, then you shall be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, you got to call on the name of the Lord. You're not just saved. You've got to do something. There's a condition there. You, you hear what I'm saying? You got to ask if you want to receive. You got to you got to knock if it's going to be open. You got you, you right? You, you got to do this. Prayer has many conditions to answer prayer. You'll just pray a prayer and it's just like automatically answered. First of all, the Bible says in James you got to ask. It says that you got to believe when you ask. Let not that man that has not faith when he asks think that he's going to receive anything from God. This isn't me. This is the Bible, right? You got to pray for God's will to be done. You got to pray in good standing with God. In Matthew 5 and 6, Jesus says very plainly in the Lord's Prayer, did you read the next two verses after the Our Father? It says, if you don't forgive, God won't answer. He says further in that chapter, if you have unforgiveness in your heart towards your brother, you can't even, don't even worship. Just put your stuff down and go make it right because your prayer is not going to be heard or answered by God if there's unforgiveness in your heart. If you're holding something against someone, there it is again. But God's love for us has no conditions. Many of the things in God's word have conditions, but God's love for us has no conditions. God loves you Period. You say, I don't get this. I don't understand. How could God do that? We don't understand it because our love is mostly conditional. You know, I love my wife with all of my heart, my soul, my bank account, everything. <laughs> right? But to be honest with you, sometimes my love for her is conditional. Right? Because sometimes I'll have a little spat and she'll say, well... You didn't treat me right. I'll say, well, well, you're supposed to love me. I'm your wife. You're supposed to, you know, love me whether I'm good or whether I'm in a good mood or a bad mood. You're supposed to love me. I don't try. <laughs> and I say something like, well, it's hard to love, it's, it's hard to hug a porcupine. <laughs> Have you ever said that to your spouse? Don't say that to your spouse. It don't <laughs> help matters at all, right? Yeah, but you, you are married, you know what I'm talking about, right? You know, we, we love and we expect something in return. That's not unconditional love, right? And some of you, we share. We do have unconditional love for our spouse. We show that at times, but most of the time, let's be honest, folks, the things we do for people, the way we treat people, we expect them to treat us the same way. And we're disappointed and upset when they don't. But it's not like that with God, his love is unconditional. Look at verse 5. I love this verse. I know I'm preaching a long time, but this is important. When we were dead in sins, God loved us. Wrap that around your brain. While you were a sinner, God loved you. He didn't wait for you to make things right. He didn't wait for you to repent and come to him. He didn't wait for you to become born again. He loved you when you were a sinner. Mm. He loved me when I was a nobody. To him, I was somebody. Romans 5 and 8 says, but God demonstrates his love for us. He demonstrates it. How? How? While we were still sinners, he died for us. No conditions. You get it? He died for you, knowing who you were or who you weren't. He died for you. This is the love that God has for you. God doesn't wait for you to please him to love you. God doesn't wait for you to do good works, to become righteous enough, or even to repent of your sins. He loves you. Hear what I'm saying. He loved you while you were drunk. 
He loved you when you were committing adultery. He loved you when you were lying and stealing and cheated. He loved you when you were murderous and rebellious and disobedient and wicked. When you were cursing him, he was blessing you. When you were mocking him, he was praising you. When you were putting him down, he was building you up. When you were yelling at him, he was whispering at you. When you were raising your fist at him, he was offering his hand down to you. When you hated God, he loved you. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. I know it's hard for us to comprehend that kind of love. But that's the love that God has for us. You say, why? Why would God love us in our sinful condition? Why have I, what have I done to deserve this unconditional God, love of the God of the universe? If you'll come, Amanda. And the answer is, he loves you not because of what you have done, but because of who you are. Wait a minute. I thought I was a sinner. No. You are his creation. You are the sons of and the daughters of God. You are his children created in his likeness. That's why he loves you. That's why he loves you unconditionally. And it may be that you have to be a parent to really comprehend this. But if you're here this morning and you, have a, you are a parent and you have children, you understand this completely. I have three sons, and I love those three sons and will give my life for them. Have my sons ever made me angry? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> have I ever wanted to strangle my sons? A couple times a day for a while. <laughs> have my sons disappointed me? Have my sons ever disobeyed and rebelled me? Have my sons ever done the exact opposite of what I commanded them to do? Yes, they did. Did I punish them? Yes, I did. Did I discipline them? Yes, I did. Was I angry at them? Wrath beyond measure. <laughs> but did I ever stop loving them? I don't care what you've done this morning. God loves you. Because you're his son. And you're his daughter. It doesn't mean that you won't suffer the consequences of your sin. That doesn't mean that if you rebel against God, you can choose to go to hell. Some people will go to hell. But God loves everyone that goes to hell. He died so that they wouldn't go to hell. That choice is ours. That's the love of God. God is rich in love and rich in mercy because of his great love for us. While we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive in Christ Jesus and raised us up to sit together with him in heavenly places right now with Christ Jesus. We can be sitting right now in the accomplished work of Jesus. I am saved. I am his child. He loves me. Stop striving. Stop working. Stop doing religious stuff to try to please God. And just accept his love, his grace, his mercy for you. Walk in freedom this morning. He loves you. He loves you. Stand with me. I need to give an altar call to you. And the altar call this morning is for those, first of all, who have not been able to receive the love of God. Because there may be people here this morning who's like, God, you know, the things I've done in my life are so terrible. The mistakes I've made are so bad that, you know, I don't deserve God's love. Well, let me just be the first to tell you this morning, you're absolutely right. You do not deserve God's love. And neither do I, nor does anybody in this house. He doesn't love you because of what you did or didn't do. He 
loves you because he created you. He's got a divine purpose for your life. He has plans for you that are good plans. In fact, of all the, in spite of all that you've done to mess it up, and he can fix it. He can make your life whole again. And you can be rich. You can be rich in Jesus this morning. Bow your heads with me, please. that's you, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in just a minute. Don't raise your hand yet. And there are other people here this morning who you've been reminded by this message of how much God's grace and mercy have been imparted to you and you're convicted by the Holy Spirit because honestly you have not treated somebody else the same way that God has treated you. You have not forgiven. You have not given mercy. You have not walked in grace towards somebody who has done you wrong, harmed you, hurt you, or a family member, or a child. I don't know what it is. It's none of my business. But it is God's business this morning. And now because of this message, you realize, because the Holy Spirit is showing it to you, you realize that you need to forgive that person, that you need grace, and you need help with that. Let's be honest. You need help. And you want God to help you. And you want to release that unforgiveness, that hurt, that bitterness. And you want to give it to God this morning. Now, if that's you this morning, I, I would ask you to raise your hand. But it may be too embarrassing. It's a very sensitive subject. So what I'm going to do this morning is I'm just going to pray a prayer. And if you are either struggling to receive God's love or if you are struggling to give God's love unconditional love to others, his mercy and his grace, as a child of God, then I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Just say, Heavenly Father, I receive your love today. I understand I don't deserve it. I haven't earned it. But the word of God that I read this morning said, it is a gift of God not earned, not because of what I've done, because of what Jesus did. And so even though I don't earn it or deserve it, I accept your love, your grace, and your mercy on my life, and I ask you to come and wash away all of my sins, remove them as far as the east is from the west, never to be brought up again in Jesus' name. Thank you. I receive that forgiveness. I receive that grace. And I'm going to walk out of the doors of this church this morning knowing that I have been cleansed, that I am free because of what Jesus did, that he will give me a new start, a new day, that today can be the best of the rest of my life starting right now. And I pray this prayer, believing in you, Jesus, confessing my sin to you, confessing my need, but reaching out to receive your grace and love and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. And also, listen, before we clap, keep your head bowed. There's others here this morning who are struggling with unforgiveness. And I want you to pray this prayer with me this morning. I want you to pray, Heavenly Father, forgive me for not being able to forgive. Today I was reminded of what you did to forgive me. And out of that grace that you have given to me, out of that mercy that you have extended to me, because you didn't give me the punishment that I deserve. And because you gave me eternal life and abundant life and freedom in Christ, even though I don't deserve it, I need you to help me to forgive him, to forgive her. Speak their name out. Not so the people beside you can hear it. <laughs> but speak their name out. Speak it. Declare it out of your mouth. Confession is made with the mouth. Romans 10, with the mouth, confession is made. Speak it. Speak it this morning. And then say, I cannot forgive them by myself. And so I give you permission, Jesus, 
to forgive them through me. I can do all things through Christ. And so I'm asking you to forgive through Christ. Forgive them. And I release them and I put them in your hands. And I pray, God, that the next time I see them, I will not have anger, but I will have love, compassion. And I will understand that hurt people hurt people. And I will know that what they did, they did because they're a sinner, because they need your grace. And I will understand that if not for God's grace, I could have been the one doing the hurting. So give me your mercy and grace and forgive through me. I give them to you today in the name of Jesus who gave his life for me. Amen, amen, and amen. Now clap your hands. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for, we can be rich in mercy and in love. If the ushers will come, we're going to serve communion this morning. You don't have to be a member of our church to receive. If you're a member of the child of the family of God, we welcome you to participate at the table with us together. First John said that we know the love that God has for us because of what God did for us. And what did he do? He sent his one and only son to die on the cross for us to forgive us of our sins so that we can walk in freedom. He fulfilled the law, Jesus did, so that we are no longer under the bondage of the law, but we walk in the grace and mercy, and the covenant of grace through Jesus. And this meal was instituted for the church, and the admonition from Jesus and from the apostles was that we are to remember Jesus. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we are to remember the price that was paid for us, the grace that is applied to us. And so we're going to ask everybody to come receive the elements and carry them back to your chairs and wait till everybody's been served and we'll partake together at the same time. If you will please come to your left to this station and return to your seats this way. If you please come to your left to this station here, this section, and return down the middle aisle to your seats. This section, you please come to your left down the middle aisle, receive from this section. Will you please come? And return to your chairs down this way. This section, you please come to your left and come to this station here and return to your seats that way. Thank you. We'll wait for everybody to be served as the musicians sing. All these pieces, broken and scattered, in mercy gathered, mended and torn, empty handed, but not forsaken. I've been set free, I've been set free. i 
Supper, he took the cup and he blessed it, saying, This is my blood which is shed for you. A new covenant I make with you, and as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth my death until I come again. Thank you, Jesus, for coming for us. Thank you for shedding your blood, which was spotless, sinless blood. The only blood that can atone for us, the righteous blood of Jesus. Thank you for the ultimate price. Greater love hath no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friend. And you said, you are my friends. Thank you for proving it. Thank you for proving your love for us. We bless this cup in the name of the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may partake. Lift our hands and thank him. Thank you, Father. Thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you that he who was rich became poor for us. That out of your poverty we might become rich. I thank you that we are leaving this building this morning rich in the love and the mercy and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.